Welcome to the Physics Colloquium. Uh, and if you didn't think this was the Physics Colloquium, you should stay anyway, because it's going to be very entertaining. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Natasha Holmes, our own Natasha Holmes. Natasha got her PhD in 2015, working with Doug Bond at the University of British Columbia. She then uh, was a postdoc with Carl Wyman's group uh, until she joined our faculty in 2017. Uh, Natasha was our department's first hire in physics education research. Uh, and uh, she was actually uh, the, the university's first hire in discipline-based education research, uh, something that now has happened in a number of other departments at, at Cornell. Uh, Cornell is actually becoming uh, a player, a serious player in discipline-based education research. Uh, a central focus of Natasha's research uh, has been physics labs, uh, particularly introductory labs. Uh, despite the centrality of experiment in physics, uh, there's a surprisingly small amount of research done before Natasha on labs and on student learning in labs, uh, particularly at the introductory level. And through uh, her work, uh, from her PhD right through to her time here at Cornell. Uh, she's actually established herself as a world leading expert on introductory labs, student learning and introductory labs, probably the world leading expert actually. Uh, her work has dramatically changed our thinking about how these labs should be taught and, uh, and what they can accomplish. Uh, her title today is putting the experiment back in the lab. Let's welcome. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Is the mic positioning okay? You can hear me. Folks online can hear me. Maybe. Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I'm excited to tell you about what we've been up to. Um, and before I get into some of the details of our work, I want to just. Um, give a sort of big picture because I think I'm the, the first PER colloquium in a while. So my, oh, come on. This was working before. There we go. Um, my sort of big picture aim as a physics education researcher has been to build a rich evidence base for lab instruction, what we should be doing, what we're getting out of it, what students are getting out of it. Um, and as a physics education researcher, not only am I studying physics education, but I'm also coming at it as much as I can from a physicist's perspective. So we do things like controlled experiments, right? Where you're trying to change sort of one variable at a time to see what the effect of a particular variable is on various student outcomes. Now, most of the time we actually change like 10 or 20 variables at a time and decide that some package of these 10 or 20 cause this outcome. Um, and over time you start to sort of disentangle the pieces of that. We've also been getting into the kind of big data statistical methods that are common in physics. Um, here, for example, I'll tell you a little bit later about a, a study where we started with this database of 50,000 student responses and slowly applied phys um, filters the way that a particle physicist would about what data do we actually want to keep um, and keep working with in this analysis. Uh, we ultimately are seeking patterns in a lot of our work. And as you can see here, our patterns can be really messy because it turns out students are really complicated uh, things to be working with. Um, but there is actual logic to, to the patterns in some of our data. Um, and with that messiness, we're also, also often getting into things like dimension reduction, um, kind of analytical techniques. This is some um, k-means cluster analyses that we did, um, trying to sort of take all kinds of different looks at students, collect data from a lot of different perspectives, and try to sort of boil it down to some key important components or, or features. And um, more recently, we've also even been getting into looking at student interactions, the way that one might look at interactions between electrons or particles, and obviously, again, interactions between students being much more, well, hard to understand. But um, we've been having fun using um, network analysis tools um, to actually quantitatively sort of make sense of those. And so in addition, we're also using more traditional statistics methods. We're pulling from the social sciences as well um, and sort of trying to marry all of these perspectives um, into our analysis. In the rest of my talk, I'm not actually going to go into the technical details of sort of how we do these studies, but know that all of this is happening in the background. 
Um, it's a lot more fun to just kind of focus on the big picture results. And so that's what we're gonna do sort of moving forward. Um, in terms of our group, we've been um, growing and, and evolving over the last um, five and a half years since I joined the department. Um, at the moment, we've got this wonderful team of postdocs and grad students and undergrads working with us, um, but it has certainly evolved over time, if my slides are gonna, there we go, um, with lots of different folks um, joining, working with us um, in various capacities. And then most recently, um, our dog Coho and our son Calvin joining our group um, this past year. Okay, let's start um, digging into the ideas of physics education. And so I want you all to put yourselves back into the perspective of when you were a physics student. And for some of you, that is today. For some of you, that may have been several years ago. Um, but thinking back, when you were a physics student, what was the best way that you learned physics concepts? And we're gonna do low tech clickers, just using your hands. One options are in class, reading the textbook, doing problem sets, or in lab. And you can either put your fingers in front of you, or if you're loud and proud, you can hold them for the world to see. And we and folks on Zoom, you're welcome to put things in the chat. Um, so on three, one, two, three. Okay. That's exactly what I expected would happen. All of the students are saying three. <laughs> <laughs> um, problem sets is the, the main place that they are learning physics concepts. Um, there's a couple of ones and twos. I don't think I saw any fours. Is that right? I don't think anyone said, oh, one. GVAC said lap. Okay. <laughs> um, so clearly this is rare. Um, most of the conceptual understanding is happening in these other places. Um, and I'm going to start to interrogate this idea a little bit more because my research is focused on what is the lab providing us. And you've all just told me it's not my understanding of physics concepts. So what does come to mind when you think about your instructional um, physics labs? And for this, I'm looking for like one word answers and I'll take three or four different hands and we'll try to get a couple different ideas. What first comes to mind when you think of your instructional physics labs? Keep your hands up, I'll grab four people. I've got one, two, three, one more hand. Four, thank you. Okay, we'll start here. Error propagation is something that comes to mind. Awesome. Prescribed procedure, awesome. Error propagation gets the second one. It didn't happen, just I didn't have labs. Um, we've got a bunch of stuff in the chat as well. Organized notebook, learning how to keep a lab notebook, um, figuring out mistakes, and that's Cool, that is not what I thought you were gonna say. <laughs> what I thought, well, either way, I think a lot of these pieces, right? What, there's a lot of things that can come out of labs and what is unique about them is the idea of all of the things that you can learn by doing a hands-on experiment, by working with equipment and observing the physical world in front of you and all of the sort of stuff that comes along with those procedures. And so, in the physics education literature, people have used labs for all kinds of different purposes. And often we talk about there's just no consensus on what labs should be used for. Um, we recently did a study where we asked instructors um, a bunch of stuff about their labs. And in particular, we wanted to sort of tease apart these goals. So this idea of, are you using labs to teach these concepts? Are you doing it for teaching things like experimental physics skills um, or we categorize mixed? Are you actually trying to do a little bit of both of those? Um, and so from this survey, this is what we had and we separated out introductory first year labs and beyond first year labs. And we see that for the most part in the first year labs, instructors are trying to do both. They're trying to um, teach concepts and teach uncertainty skills and who, the double error propagation is, is real, right? Most instructors, the skills that they're adding on is usually error propagation. Um, and then we've got about 30% of the labs are exclusively trying to teach experimental physics skills. 20% are exclusively trying to reinforce the concepts from lecture. Um, beyond first year labs seem to have a different system. Most of them are just focused on experimental physics skills. I think that's mostly equipment stuff. Um, the next most common is doing a little bit of both, but barely any beyond first year labs are exclusively about reinforcing concepts, which is a pretty different picture. I should say these data are limited in an interesting way. Um, this was a survey where we asked, these were instructors who wanted to use a couple of other instruments with their classes 
about evaluating students' experimental physics skills. So you can imagine that we are overrepresenting in skills-based labs. I think that the percentage of, of courses exclusively teaching concepts here is an underestimate. And so um, either way, what we see is that a lot of classes are trying to do both, right? They're trying to teach concepts on top of a bunch of skills. And this leads me to my first claim. I'm gonna give you three claims today. The first one is, if you wanna teach concepts, use a demo or a simulation, don't use lab. I'm gonna present some evidence for this claim. So the first set of evidence comes from a study that we did where we were evaluating this, this, um, the role of lab in teaching concepts. Because you've all just told me that it doesn't work. We want some actual data to back that up. So we took advantage of a uh, natural experiment where a number of institutions had the introductory physics labs as optional. So students could decide to take them or not. But in all three of these institutions, the labs were exclusively designed to reinforce the course material. So to teach the sort of conceptual understanding. So this gives us the ability to ask the question, does taking a lab that's designed to reinforce the course material actually improve student understanding of that course material? And so we can directly compare the performance of students who take the lab from the students who don't take the lab. Um, and we use their final exam as a measure of this because that is what tests the course material, at least according to the instructor. Now, of course, an optional lab means we've got some systematic differences between the students taking the lab and not taking the lab. And so we had to sort of reconcile, um, deal with those sorts of systematics. Um, and in this case, we take advantage of the fact that the course has a whole bunch of physics concepts. So the physics exam, for example, probes a whole bunch of different physics concepts and only a subset of those have a lab to reinforce those ideas. So we can use the questions that don't have a lab as this sort of normalization between students to do some sort of scaling. So with all of that in mind, we calculated with this normalization, something that we called a mean lab benefit. And so based on how I've defined that term, what do you expect, um, what does a positive, negative, or zero mean lab benefit mean? So if the lab improves understanding of the course material beyond what's happening in the lecture discussion, will the mean lab benefit be positive, negative, or zero? And you can just use your thumb to tell me if you think it's gonna be positive, negative, or zero. Again, on three, one, two, three. Okay, this is how I get everyone in the audience to give me a thumbs up that I'm doing a good job. Thank you, yes. So positive means lab is gonna improve understanding, negative is gonna be actually the lab hurts students understanding, zero means neutral, and essentially zero means that the students um, taking the lab or not taking the lab have the same scores when we take into account this normalization. Okay, ready for data? Yes, this is the data. So we had three different institutions, three different courses at each institution, a mix of mechanic, me and M. The thing, a lot of differences between these courses, the thing that was in common was that they were all exclusively trying to reinforce course material and they all measurably did not do that, right? These things are within error bars, um, indistinguishable from zero. Um, and so in the paper, we conclude with a high degree of precision, there was no statistically measurable lab benefit. It's not to say that labs can't teach the conceptual understanding, but overwhelmingly, we couldn't measure it. And when that's your only goal, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so my claim though was, if you wanna teach concepts, don't use a lab, but I also offered some alternatives, teach, use demos or simulations. And let me sort of break those down a little bit. Um, the work from demos comes from decades of research on what are called interactive lecture demonstrations. So I'm sure we all have incredibly memorable moments of exciting, extravagant demos happening in our classes, either as instructors or as students, um, they're incredibly memorable. And when you package them with some active learning strategies, um, they can be measurably, incredibly effective at students, um, improving students' conceptual understanding. So this paper by Catherine Crouch and colleagues found, um, so R, the, the y-axis here is students' rate of correctness on either um, explain or listing the outcome of a demo, like what actually just happened, and then explaining conceptually what was going on in the demonstration. And so, and we're comparing to not seeing a demo at all. So if you just observe it, there's a small bump to your conceptual understanding. If you first have the students make a prediction and then observe it, there's an even bigger bump. 
And if you have them do what's called predict, observe, explain, so they predict the demo, they observe it, and then they turn to their neighbors to have a conversation, explain what just happened in their own words to their peer, um, we get again, a sort of another boost to students' understanding. And that's not to say that we shouldn't um, discredit the memorableness and the entertainment side of demonstrations. Um, and I am guilty of this. So um, this is a shout out to my TikTok that went viral in spring 2020, uh, where I was doing the conservation of energy demo where you hold the bowling ball up to your nose and let it go and it comes right back up. Um, and a student in my class recorded it and posted on TikTok. And when I lost track of it, there were 3.6 million likes on TikTok. Um, so yes, demos can still be very entertaining as well as being educational, and you can have both. Um, the other pedagogy that I mentioned were simulations, and there's a lot of research looking at the effectiveness of simulations for student learning. I'm going to plug a study that we did a couple years ago. Um, this was led by Jack Madden, who was a graduate student in the astronomy department, as well as some colleagues that we have in the communication department. Um, and we compared student learning through three conditions. So we randomly assigned students either to a hands-on um, sort of lab activity, a desktop simulation, or a virtual reality simulation. And in all three cases, the students were learning about moon phases. So we gave them a test of their sort of conceptual understanding of moon phases at the beginning. They went through the activity, and then we gave them a demo at the end. Um, this is a sort of picture of the virtual reality simulation. It was beautiful, if I can just say. Um, I didn't do any of the programming, right? So it's not, um, this was pretty much all Jack. Um, there's a video at the top linked if you're interested in sort of seeing um, what that sort of looked like. It was a really fun, VR is cool, right? Uh, anyway, so back to the data, when we compare students' performance on the pre and the post-test. Um, so these are distributions, you've got the pre-test scores and then the post-test scores with each of the students and this sort of um, distribution and what we see is there's no difference between student learning. Everyone learns from these activities, but they all learn the same um, across the modalities, which tells us that um, it's really not about the actual like hands-on part of it. It really is about the thinking that's going on, um, particularly some of the like guiding questions that we had in the activity. So all of this to say, we've got measurable improvements of student understanding through demos and simulations, we, or, or the same, I should say. <laughs> Uh, we have no measurable learning from hands-on activities and the demos and the simulations are way more efficient, right? It is just way easier um, in terms of you know, cost and time and all kinds of things to run demos and simulations. Okay, now you may be thinking still, but that doesn't mean that we can't teach concepts um, with the labs. Maybe this like mixed paradigm is the best thing to go with, which was what most of our students, most of the instructors were doing. So this leads me to claim number two, which is that labs that aim to teach concepts also have some troublesome side effects. And let me talk about what some of those are. Um, how many folks have TA'd in the intro labs here? Cool, okay. This is all gonna be super familiar. Um, so, in our mechanics labs, we do an experiment where we have students testing the amplitude dependence of the period of a pendulum. So we particularly constrain them to measuring, making measurements of the pendulum when released from 10 degrees and 20 degrees. Um, we give them some flexibility in the experimental design in terms of how much data to collect, how to collect the data, and a couple other things. Um, and then we compare, and then we have the students compare within uncertainties um, whether those whether those periods are distinguishable or indistinguishable. Um, we, I think recently give them the expression that the period is um, only related to the length of the pendulum, not to its mass, not to the amplitude um, or other things. But we also list a number of assumptions that this expression makes, including that the angle is small. And so this small angle approximation that happens in the derivation of this formula with the pendulums that we're working with in the lab that's gonna actually mean that the periods here differ by about 0.02 seconds with a sort of standard length of a, of a pendulum. And so if you have precision better than 0.01 seconds, you should be able to distinguish these two pendulum periods. So with a reaction timing uncertainty of 0.1 seconds, if you press start, let it swing 10 times and press stop, you should be able to distinguish um, those two periods. So knowing the physics, what fraction of students do you think will measure this in the lab 
with a stopwatch. Zero to 10%, 10 to 25%, 25 to 50, or more than half of the class will measure this themselves in the lab. On three, one, two, three. Oh, once again, this is not what I was expecting. I'm seeing twos and threes. People are thinking uh, 10 to 25 percent or 25 to 30, 50 percent. Okay, ready? Fewer than 10 percent, <laughs> at least on on sort of the first round. Um, yeah, it is it is very very rare that students will actually find this distinction with their own measurements. Why? Now. I want you to turn to your neighbor, have a conversation about why you think fewer than 10% do. I will randomly call on a few groups to speak back. Everyone who's done a TA training session with me is laughing right now. I wonder why. <laughs> uh, yeah, turn to your neighbors, why fewer than 10%? And then I will call on some people. Okay, there was a nice lull, so I'm going to cut you off. Okay, um, I lied. I'm not going to randomly choose people because I know it's not going to be random. Uh, can I get three hands from different groups who want to share just one reason each, just sort of one sentence, why you think this is happening? Thank you. One, two, three. Let's go there. Okay, let's start with Lauren. They are biased. They see what they want to see. Awesome. Carolyn. They just want to get the lab done and go home and do other things. Wonderful. Phil. They specifically want to prove that formula. Awesome. All of these things are, are true. Uh, anything on Zoom? Uh, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff on Zoom. What do we have? Whoops. Um, students know an expected outcome. They think they know what they're supposed to get. Um, students want to finish the lab. The timing uncertainty, just that they actually don't get that uncertainty small enough. Um, yeah, ditto, that came up twice. Awesome. Okay, there's a lot of reasons that this happens. I'm going to tell you a story about a particular reason that we have been particularly concerned about. Um, and whoops, before I do that, um, what I'm going to show you on the next slide is a set of conclusions that a student wrote once they actually did find, they got their uncertainty small enough and found the distinguishability. The student says, the opposite of the expected happened, the measured values are different. Conclusion, the period of a pendulum does depend on the angle with the vertical in the initial position. You can't see my cursor. Um, the algebraically derived formula is only valid for small angles. Considering the results of this experiment, 20 degrees is obviously not small enough. If you can make a precise enough measurement, you can show that the theoretical derivation of the equation of motion for a pendulum is just a good approximation and reality is slightly more complicated. This is a beautiful conclusion, right? Richie's like, what? This is awesome. Um, this is an intentionally cherry picked example. I want to be very clear about this. This is not a common conclusion. It is a beautiful conclusion. And what it shows me is some very rich understanding that the student has about the relationship between the precision of your experimental measurement, the depth of the model that you can actually investigate, um, all kinds of wonderful stuff here. And yet, they did not expect this to happen, right? They started off with the opposite of the expected happened. The measured values are different, underline, underline. And this ex expectation is, is huge, right? Even though this student knew about the small angle approximation. Um, and we've been interrogating <laughs> this idea of the expectations in a lot of different ways. And this, um, a student 
uh, when I did a series of interviews at the end of the year, just asking a student about what they learned in the course, this experience was incredibly um, memorable. So the student says, the pendulum experiment we did at the beginning of the year, I think that really made a mark on me because I went in there expecting the period at 10 and 20 degrees to be the same because that's what I was taught. And then when you finally figure out that, oh, it's supposed to be different. And then I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't be doing experiments with bias going in. Okay. And so uh, we started looking at this a little bit more. Um, and I want to actually give a shout out. So Martin Stein was a graduate student working on this who was doing some analysis of students' lab notes for an unrelated thing and was like, there's something weird here that I think we should look at. Um, and so he and then Emily Smith, who was a postdoc with us, started going through students' lab notebooks and looking for evidence of this kind of bias um, and what we call questionable research practices. Um, so in their lab notes, for example, and again, I said students have a little bit of flexibility with their experimental design. We're particularly trying to get students to find ways to reduce their uncertainty because that's what sort of re reveals this distinguishability. So the student says, we will now try to be more precise by recording 10 consecutive periods so that the periods are more alike. They explicitly have this intent for the result that they wanna get. Um, another group, as an example, they got their uncertainty better than that 0.01 second precision. And so they're starting to see these periods as being distinguishable. And so in their conclusions, they say, based on our results, our values were possibly different. However, considering the unreasonably low uncertainty, it is believed that our values probably were probably not different. Therefore, we tried using 0.02 seconds as our uncertainty. After doing so, our test statistic equaled 0.8367, which would prove that our values were probably not different. This is the classic, let me just inflate my error bars. Oh, look, they agree with an uncertainty. This is great. And this is what students report in their lab notes to be graded by the TA. Um, we also have a number of studies where we've, using, we've got video cameras in our labs and we listen to students' conversations. And you can imagine about what's happening in those discussions that doesn't get recorded in their lab notes. It's fun. Um, and so um, Martin and Emily went through the students' lab notes and looked for all of the instances of these sorts of questionable research practices. And anywhere, depending on when we've implemented this, anywhere from 10 to 60% of groups in a course um, will exhibit one or more of these questionable research practices. And now we're sort of laughing at this behavior, but I want to be clear, this is our fault. <laughs> this is not their fault. We have sort of set them up for this situation. Um, and in another interview, a student helped sort of demonstrate what it is that's going on when they start engaging this way. So a student says, when you realize that there's something wrong with your experiment, if you're just trying to get the result right there and then, well, you get frustrated because it's not working. And then uh, sometimes when those labs, when you don't get the result you want, you're tempted because you know exactly what result you want. So it's tempting to just massage what you've gotten until it looks like something like a distant relative of what you want. Okay. Um, and so this temptation, this idea that um, there is this result that they think they're supposed to get and the whole game is just to get that result. Um, we actually think that this isn't just about playing the school game. We think that this actually has some bigger implications. And the reason I say that is because we and other researchers have done surveys of students um, and found that many introductory physics students believe that the purpose of experiment generally is to confirm previously known results and that experimental results should be evaluated based on their agreement with theory or previous results. And this isn't just the results that I get in the lab, but like experimental physicists do this, um, which is obviously problematic in a bunch of ways. And so um, the way that we've sort of been thinking about this is that we've been, we've set up that the lab is this sort of like experimental practice um, in service of theory. And what we wanna, and, and in doing so, right, we sort of sacrifice all of the parts about experimental physics practice in service of, of theory. So what do we do instead? Well, we want to sort of flip that over. And instead we wanna use theory to serve um, practice or even the way that I often think of it is just practice in service of practice. That's um, for, anyway, um, and so um, locally, what we've, we've been over the last several years redesigning the intro lab sequence with all of this research in mind. Um, and one of the ways that we started doing that was um, I did a series of interviews with instructors and experimental physics faculty um, here in the department to ask questions like, 
if we're not going to use lab to teach canonical physics concepts, what do you think students should learn in the intro physics labs? Um, I also asked, what do you wish students joining your research lab were able to do? And for those teaching the upper division lab courses, what do you wish students in these courses were already able to do coming into that experience? Um, and so we had all kinds of all kinds of ideas um, and various um, skills and, and um, practices and ways of thinking that we sort of tried to condense into sort of big picture ideas um, and things that we thought were actually achievable in an intro lab. And that eventually led us to a set of learning goals for what is now physics 1110 and 2210. And so the learning goals are that by the end of the course, students should be able to collect data and revise an experimental procedure iteratively and reflectively, evaluate the process and outcomes of an experiment quantitatively and qualitatively, extend the scope of an investigation, whether or not the results come out as expected, communicate the process and outcomes of an experiment and conduct an experiment collaboratively and ethically. And as a reminder, for those who aren't aware of this shift, physics 1110 and 2210 are now our separated out um, introductory physics lab courses, not tied to any theory course. It's just lab in service of lab. Um, and so the structure of these, um, physics 1110, for example, we do six experiments over the course of the whole 15 week semester. A lot of the experiments students spend two to three weeks on so that we're really getting depth rather than breadth. Um, we cover mechanics and e &M concepts in the lab now. And we describe that over time, we are sort of giving students increasing agency or decreasing the structure that we give to them in the instructions. So we start with a period of pendulum lab that I've already told you about. We end the course with a project lab where the students get to ask their own questions um, and design the experiments themselves. And then we sort of scale towards that over time. Um, and as an example, I'm going to tell you, and I should say, um, so Emily Smith was a huge part of this initial design um, as a postdoc and Yasmin Calendar um, helped with some of the sort of later stages of the pieces. Um, as an example, I'm going to tell you about my favorite lab that happens in the middle, which is our stretchy things lab, also known as testing Hooke's law. Um, so in this lab, students are tasked with bringing in stretchy stuff from home and evaluating, designing experiments to evaluate the extent to which they are, uh, they obey Hooke's law. Um, and just to show how we do this sort of theory in service of practice, right? It's not actually about Hooke's law. <laughs> it's about the experimental skills that they learn in this process. So for example, this group um, learned a lot about control of variables. They came up with this research question with a bungee cord where they wanted to evaluate, you know, if I have it just loop once versus if I double it, like what happens to the extension in these different, um, uh, setups. Um, other group, my favorite picture comes from this group who brought in gummy worms to evaluate the extent to which gummy worms obey Hooke's law. Um, and so they spend a lot of time asking really interesting questions and grappling with the issues of reproducibility, because it turns out once you start stretching a gummy worm, that gummy worm is forever changed. <laughs> and so you can't go back and like redo stuff. Um, this group, and I know other groups have also looked at when stretchy things, what happens to the behavior, behavior right before they break. And so again, once you've broken it, you can't redo the experiment. Um, so they're learning a lot about experimental design here. Um, and then during the pandemic, when we were doing remote instruction, we had the students working with stuff around the house. Um, so they didn't have our force probes. They didn't have our set of standardized weights. And so they had to get really care, um, creative with designing their measurements. So this group, for example, realized that um, pennies have a standard and standardized enough weight that they can just systematically add more pennies and increase the force um, incrementally. And I think another group, Bill told me about like using water for the same purpose, right? Because you know the density and the volume of the water so they can figure out the mass. Anyway, lots of cool stuff. Um, yeah, I love this lab. Uh, in Physics 2210, we do an open project. So it's a semester long project. The students um, get to propose, design, conduct, and present their own investigations. Um, ideally, that sort of build on previous investigations. Um, but even with how unstructured this is, we put in a ton of structure. Um, so students have to generate a proposal. That proposal gets reviewed by peers and experts, experts being like faculty and instructors in the department. Um, they have to submit weekly progress reports that we can check in on, um, and then they give presentations at the end. So even as unstructured as it seemed, we, we structure it as much as we can. Okay, 
And so my claim number three is that by making this switch, focusing exclusively on experimental physics practices, students develop incredibly rich skill sets and perspectives on experimental physics with no detriment to their course grades. And so my, re my data from this particularly, well, I'm gonna describe two studies um, that sort of speak to this point. One of them um, led by Emily Smith with work by Martin Stein and Cole Walsh, who is another graduate student um, with us. Uh, when we first started redesigning the labs here, we took it, we were able to sort of set up a uh, fairly controlled experiment. So students were all taking the same lecture. They had the same discussion section activities, doing the same homework problems, writing the same exams, but students enrolled in one of five labs. And then we randomly assigned three of those labs to be our traditional concepts-based labs and two of them to be this new kind of skills-based lab. Um, and so we have about 20 students per section. So we get 60 students in one condition, 40 in another. Um, and the concepts-based labs were such that we had nine experiments over the semester, a different topic each week. Um, in the skills-based labs, we had only five experiments over those same nine weeks. And so um, the students, again, are sort of spending two weeks at a time on some of the experiments. So we you know, cut the exposure to content essentially in half um, in these skills-based labs, but we also completely change the goals and remove any intent for students to develop conceptual understanding. Um, we measured a lot about these students. They were probably sick of us by the end of it because we collected as much data as we could. Um, and so I'm gonna just give you the highlights of what happened and not actually show you the data, but obviously I'm happy to dig into the details if you want to. Um, but we looked for stuff like in their lab notes, did they, when they did an experiment, did they do any sort of iterating on their experimental design, sort of finding ways to improve their experiment? And in this case, the skills-based labs outperformed the concepts-based labs. Um, we looked at situations where their data were likely to disagree with the model, such as in that pendulum experiment. And so we looked at, did students, could students actually measure that um, distinction? Um, and did they do any sort of exploring of these model limitations? And again, the skills-based labs win. Uh, we measured their views about experimental physics. Skills-based labs are better. We measured their views about experimental results and their uh, skills-based labs are better. And then we measured their traditional exam scores. And surprise, surprise, they were the same. <laughs> because again, we're pretty sure lab has no effect on students' conceptual understanding. Um, in addition, students develop and appreciate the sense of agency that we give them. So um, a study led by Yasmin Callender with Emily Stump, um, who's a graduate student, and Caitlin Hubenig, who is an undergraduate student working with us. Um, we had sort of a pre and post survey where we asked students um, about their sort of sense of control in the lab, how much do they have control over what's happening? Um, and that systematically improves um, in both the course, uh, when these courses were separated, um, the lab course for physics majors and for engineering majors. Um, we also asked students, what was their favorite lab unit and why? And most students say the final project lab is their favorite. If you were to guess one word, why students like the final project lab, what do you think is their reasoning? You can just shout stuff out this time. Agency. What was that? Agency. 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 Yes. Other words? Freedom. There we go. Yeah. Freedom is the word that they use um, to describe their preference. Um, we actually did a like systematic analysis of all of the student statements, but this word cloud is a much prettier figure than the other ones in the paper. Um, freedom is the thing that jumps out as um, as the thing that they, they really appreciate at the end of the semester. Okay, um, what about beyond Cornell? So we've done a lot of work locally, but we've also, you know, research, physics education research is more than just about the local implementation. Um, and we are not the only institution making this shift towards skills-based labs. And so as you move towards um, other institutions, you need to start to standardize your assessment a little bit more. And so over the last seven-ish years, we've been developing an assessment that we call the Physics Lab Inventory of Critical Thinking or the PLIC. Um, and in this scenario, we give them um, uh, scenarios of a mass on a spring experiment. We sort of describe the methods and show the data that's collected from these experiments. 
Um, and we ask questions that probe three constructs of critical thinking in the context of experimental physics, um, evaluating data, evaluating methods, and proposing next steps in an investigation. And so Cole, Cole Walsh, who is a graduate student with us, led the development of this assessment. Catherine Quinn, who was also a graduate student, um, helped with some of the validation pieces. Um, yeah. In the study where we used this assessment, we also used a second assessment, and that was the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science Survey for Experimental Physics, also known as the E-Class. Um, and this instrument was developed by Heather Lewandowski um, and her group at the University of Colorado Boulder. And on this assessment, respondents are given statements about experimental physics. For example, when doing an experiment, I try to understand how the experimental setup works. Um, and so you can sort of disagree to agree on that statement. And then your score is based on whether your answer aligns with what an experimental physicist would say about their own research. So experimental physicists would agree. So if a student picks agree, they get a one. If they pick disagree, they get a minus one. If they pick neutral, I think they get zero. Okay, um, and so uh, in a particular study, we worked with Heather um, with the, this gigantic E-class data set. Um, Cole ran the analysis on this one. And between these two assessments, they ended up, we ended up using a data set with over 20,000 students um, internationally in first year physics labs from over 80 institutions. And on the instruments, the students self-report things like their demographics, so their um, gender and race and ethnicity, for example. And instructors who sign up to use this survey with their students also get a survey. And so we ask them whether their labs are, um, uh, whether the course goal is to reinforce concepts from lecture, to develop lab skills, or do a mixture of both. These themes should be pretty familiar now. Um, but we also ask a number of questions about the sort of pedagogical activities happening in the lab. So um, to what extent do students um, do sort of uh, mathematical or conceptual modeling activities? To what extent are they doing communication activities like writing lab reports or um, keeping a lab notebook or giving presentations? Um, we ask the extent to which they engage in sort of decision-making stuff. So do they get to design experiments, um, implement ways to reduce uncertainty, stuff like that. And then data analysis, error propagation, uncertainty evaluation activities as well. And so the first thing that we looked at was um, what are students' scores between these three lab types? And so there's a whole bunch of analysis where we're controlling for both students' um, sort of pretest scores, so their incoming performance on these assessments, as well as a number of demographic variables. Um, so you can think of this as if three identical students in all kinds of different ways are randomly assigned to either the course based or the concepts based labs, the skills based labs, or the mixed labs, what would be their post test score um, as a result? And this is the pattern that we see. So on both assessments, um, students in the skills-based labs outperform the students in the concepts-based labs with the mix being interestingly in the middle. Okay. Um, so we say that you know, controlling for these incoming scores and demographic characteristics, um, students in these skills-based labs have uh, more expert-like views and critical thinking skills at the end of the course. Okay. Um, Another question that we wanted to understand is, is this necessarily the same for all groups or are those results only actually representing sort of the majority group in our data? And the reason that we wanted to look at this is because we know from all kinds of different research that not all students experience the same instruction the same way. In labs in particular, um, we and others have evidence that students divide roles with things like gender in mind. So a quick segue that I think I have time for um, is a, a study that was led by Catherine Quinn um, with data analysis and data collection by um, Catherine Miguel and Michelle Kelly. Uh, undergraduate Zachary Witz helped with some of the analysis. Um, and then Emily Smith worked with me to kind of oversee the details. Um, and so again, in our sort of local um, lab context here, this controlled experiment that we ran, we looked at what students were doing in the lab. Who, what do they have their hands on sort of systematically throughout the lab um, sessions? And we wanted to look at the, whether men and women take on different roles in the lab. So what I'm gonna show you is sort of the primary role that the students were taking on and what distribution of students fell into which kind of role, either um, handling a sort of desktop computer that was provided in the lab, uh, working with the equipment 
working on their own personal laptops, which we think is a proxy for um, keeping the lab notebook or doing data analysis, um, or working on paper, which is usually filling out those sort of worksheets in the, in the concept-based labs, or other, which is usually talking to each other or the TA, or I don't know what else. Okay. Um, so in the traditional lab, this is what the distributions look like. So what we see is that most students are in this sort of paper worksheet role, and there's no systematic difference between men and women. So everyone is kind of falling into the same. There's no, yeah, most people are falling into um, the paper role, um, and men and women aren't different in sort of this distribution. In the skills-based lab, however, we first of all see that students are more distributed, right? So more of these roles um, seem to be common. And if I highlight these two in particular, there's this slight skewing um, where the men are more often on the equipment handling role and women are more often on the laptop, which again, we think is a proxy for um, lab notebook and data analysis. So in the skills labs, we say students in general are sort of taking on different, more different roles, um, but with men and women taking on slightly different roles. And so this sort of raises the question with this survey analysis that we were doing, um, what, what might we, what, based on this data, what might we have been worried about um, in terms of, for example, women's performance? Would we expect that um, either way, the skills or students are in the, women in the skills-based labs are still gonna outperform women in the concepts-based labs? Uh, do we think actually students in the, women in the concepts-based labs are going to do better or do we think maybe there's gonna be no difference? And we can do a quick one, two, three, on three, one, two, three. We may have lost everyone. Okay, I'm seeing ones and twos and threes. Yeah, so um, we're, we're particularly, well, anyway, we don't know. It could be any of these. Um, and so it's important to check. We did the same disaggregation by race and ethnicity. So on the E class, we were actually pleasantly surprised to see that the pattern holds regardless of race, ethnicity, and gender. So students in the skills-based labs, no matter what their sort of demographic characteristics, have higher E-class scores. Um, we do the same thing for the PLIC. Um, some of the demographic characteristics are gonna go away because our error bars start to get bigger. We don't have quite as much data on the PLIC as they have with the E-class, um, but the, patterns, the pattern is the same um, on the PLIC as well. Um, the mix, you'll start to notice, has some weird behavior, and that's an interesting thing to start to tease apart. Um, but at least those extremes between the skills and the concepts is consistent. Okay. So I have made three claims and thrown a lot of data at you today. So the claims that I made are that if you want to teach concepts, use a demo or a simulation, don't use lab. Um, labs that aim to teach concepts also have some troublesome side effects. And that by focusing on experimental physics, students develop these rich skill sets and perspectives on physics um, with no detriment to their first grades. So what's next? We're doing all kinds of super fun things. Um, one of them is that we know that a lot of students don't are really expecting lab to still be about this confirmation thing. And so we're doing a lot of analysis to understand how do we support students in shifting into this sort of new mode that we wanna promote. Um, there's also a question of how do we support instructors in this shift, because this is also new to a lot of our TAs and instructors. Um, there's a bigger question of what kind of structure or freedom is needed at what point. Like I sort of described our endpoints, but everything in the middle is kind of, we're not really sure how to sort of fade the structure. Um, and does that depend on the student population, um, all kinds of stuff. And as we start to answer that question, we need more efficient ways of measuring students' um, engagement in experimental physics. And so we've been um, playing around with machine learning, natural language processing methods as one way um, to start to uh, interrogate that question a bit more. Um, the equity question obviously has a lot of um, important things to deal with. So how do we structure labs um, to, so that students are taking on these lab roles more equitably? There's a question of what is causing the inequities and we started to tackle this. We did one study where we showed it's not just that men and women have different preferences. Um, for the different um, roles. And so what is it? Um, does this inequity actually matter beyond just their participation? So does it affect their learning and attitudes and all those sorts of things is another question. Um, and then what other benefits and challenges are there um, to making this shift towards skills-based labs? So um, does, how does lab support students' interactions with their peers or their perceptions of their peers? 
um, how do students understand measurement uncertainty in this sort of new modality that we're really trying to teach it um, very contextually. Um, and then a side question, does this change once they reach, for example, quantum mechanics and other things? Um, anyway, lot, lots and lots and lots of stuff going on, um, which at which point I wanna make a quick pitch. If you are looking for summer research opportunities, we've got a bunch of stuff and we need more people um, to help us deal with the, the mounds of data that we're, we've collected. And so um, the last thing I wanna say is that um, I've given you a lot of data to make these claims, but I don't think I actually needed to give you any data or I only needed to give you one piece of data. And that's that if you look at our department, for example, about half of our faculty are experimental physicists and probably a higher fraction of our graduate students are experimental physicists. And yet our students are required, our undergraduate students are only required to take three labs throughout their physics major, three. Um, so sure, labs probably can teach theory, but why should they? <laughs> when else do students get to actually play with experimental physics if not in the lab? And with that, I will thank my group um, and a lot of other people. I wanna give a shout out to Mark Laurie Moran who made so much of our lab uh, overhaul possible um, and Phil Krasicki and a number of instructors and faculty who have helped us along the way and some external collaborators as well. So. Thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions. So the question is, um, you're asking these questions about sort of what's going on in physics labs. When you ask the same of biology, what's going on? And I'll add chemistry, for example. Um, the short answer is I have no idea, <laughs> um, which is not entirely true. There's a very rich, um, particularly biology education research literature on labs. Um, and I think biology labs have been a little bit more forward thinking than physics in this push to sort of more open-ended and more authentic labs. So they've been implementing what are called course-based undergraduate research experiences where students um, in a semester, a faculty member gives the students a project in a course and the students have the whole semester to do um, a project that is actually tied to this researcher's research program. So they are actually doing experiments that are, um, have unpublished results, right? Like it is, they, there's really no um, answer to those questions. Um, in my mind, that is a, it's an interesting piece. Um, I know of two papers in physics where they have tried to do something like this. I think it gets hard because we know that the, the distance between sort of the understanding at the intro level and at a research level is huge. And so in physics, I don't know how much would the students actually get out of that experience. And so it's sort of this question, which brings up a bigger question of, you know, I've said, Let's not use, let's not worry about theory in the lab, but obviously the students have to have some physical understanding of what's going on. And so it's an interesting sort of paradigm, I think, um, between those. I don't know if that answered the question. I could talk about that for a while. Um, I should add, we are also developing, so our physics lab inventory of critical thinking, the PLIC, we have also developed the EcoBLIC, which is the biology lab inventory of critical thinking for ecology. Um, so we're going to be doing a lot of assessments um, with that instrument now and hoping to start to look at the relationship between student thinking and biology and physics um, on that one, which will be really, we're really excited about. Um, I'm gonna pull a question from the Zoom and then we're gonna go back and forth. Um, ben, do you wanna ask your question on mute or do you want me to read it? I will read it then. Um, ben asks, can you give us a preview about how students select roles if not by their preference? Um, and then what can instructors do to help without pointing out the problem and addressing it conspicuously? It's a great question. Um, so if it's not preference, um, we don't entirely know what it is. So we know that it's not preference. One thing that we know is that when the students are um, divide, like students are in a group and they're about to divide and conquer and everyone is about to sort of take on different roles. What we understand is that there is no systematic conversation about who's going to do what. Students talk about, we just sort of fall into the roles. It just kind of happens. 
Um, and so we've been very excitingly doing some new analysis during the pandemic. Um, so Matt Du and a number of folks have been analyzing video of students when they were working from home and they're on Zoom, they're all in different places. And so in those settings, one person had to set up the equipment and the evidence so far is telling us that every week, basically someone else um, takes on the equipment and they have to have this very explicit conversation about who's gonna set up the equipment today. Um, and so it seems to be that this, what was the language? It's so unfair, it's fair, um, is the working title of that, of that paper where like, it's so blatantly obvious if one person were to do it every time. Whereas in the lab, when the equipment's just there, you know, it's not, it's just way more subtle. Um, so in terms of the question of what do we, how can we as instructors deal with that without making it obvious? We expect that just saying in general, we wanna make sure everyone has a turn on these different roles. And so take turns every week um, is probably a big step towards that. But I expect you have to be like, really vigilant about making sure it actually happens. And we're not entirely sure how to do that without being super awkward. Um, I don't know, that's, that's my idea. Question from in, in here, yeah. Uh, can you say a little bit more? Right, so the, the question is, um, can that sort of the confirmation bias that we've seen in the lab, like with the pendulum, could that be addressed in the theory lecture? That's the question. Um, so yes and no. So um, let me first of all answer why I think no, because the student in the example that I showed you clearly had seen the small angle derivation, right? And so they'd seen that this thing doesn't matter. Um, and yet they still had this expectation that it, it, was, it wasn't going to matter, yeah. Um, but I think that there is a bigger issue. So, um, oh man, now I'm going to Megan's Perk paper, right? I think is the answer to this question. Um, the, it really is, it's not just about um, the physics. We think it really is about them understanding what is the point of lab here? What is my purpose here? Um, and so we talk about this uh, a thing from education called framing. So the students sort of positioning themselves, trying to orient, what is my purpose here? What, is I, what am I supposed to be doing? And what counts as knowledge here? Um, and so we actually expect that the instructor probably has a really big role in the lab to help shift students, to just say, this isn't about confirming the equation from the book. This is really about, you know, whatever your data say, goes, right? That is truth. And that's what we have to grapple with. And if it disagrees with something in the book, then we need to make sense of that and figure out what might be going on. Um, and so we think it really is about the lab in that, in that setting. Um, but we do have a little bit of evidence that the instructor can be incredibly powerful at swaying students one way or another, I think is a fair summary of a lot of stuff. Yeah. Other questions? Carolyn, yeah. How do we figure out the balance of structure and agency? Yeah, the short answer is I have no idea. <laughs> so I, I usually have a graph where we talk about sort of what happens over time. And I've got, we, we've been playing with two axes, one that's the, the like decision-making structure. So how much are you telling the students what to do? And then this like outcome structure of, do they know what the expected outcome of the experiment is or is it really open-ended? Um, and I say, you know, you don't wanna be in the top corner where you tell everyone what to do and you, they know what the outcome is. You also don't want to just start, we're, we're pretty sure you don't want to just start in the bottom, whatever other corner where it's, I'm not going to tell you anything to do. And it doesn't matter what the outcome is. You just like, here's a room full of equipment and do whatever you want. Right. It's, it's somewhere in the middle, but honestly, I have no, like there's some wavy line <laughs> that goes back. Um, we've been, there are like models in education that start to speak to this point a little bit. So um, there are some folks who use what's called a cognitive apprenticeship model, 
we've been using a deliberate practice model, but when we actually looked at our instructions, we don't actually use a deliberate practice model, but we're informed by that. Um, I think it's hard and I, I most, most of our sort of finessing the structure balance has been through iteration and just having conversations with students and with TAs um, and trying to make sense of the, make sense of it locally for our students. Very non-answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the question is, how does grading play into this? And again, this is a moment where all the TAs, anyone who's TA this lab is like, Ugh. um, so we've we've been using the students' lab notes as the assessment. So students in the lab notes are supposed to document um, what they're doing and why they're doing it throughout the lab. Um, and so we sort of use that documentation as sort of the evidence of students' engagement in the kinds of skills and behaviors that we're doing. So um, we look for, are the students' conclusions supported by their data? And is there a um, obvious improvement to their experiment that they did not implement? Um, and sort of start to look at the quality of the investigations that way. Um, it's incredibly tedious, right? People who have graded these lab notes before are nodding. Yeah, um, but it's it's the best we've come up with so far. Yeah, yeah. and I think, are we at five? Should we cut off or? Okay. <laughs> So the, the question is, so Cornell only requires three labs, but the institution that um, this student went to had required way more labs. And so is there a relationship between the number of labs and, for example, students' perspectives about experimental physics? I have no idea. That is a great question. I don't even know how we would, we, mm, no, we could probably do it with the E-class and Flick data set that we have, because we know what institution all the students were at. You could go and find out how many courses. Yeah, we could answer that question. Are you looking for something to do this summer? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think we, we have case studies of institutions that have particular focuses on labs where they've seen all kinds of incredible outcomes, but I have no idea. And I think the other question that you'd wanna control for is undergraduate research experience as well, because I expect students doing experimental physics um, research would have a, a very rich changing. And then the question is like, does it depend on the lab or is it just the number of labs, I don't know. See, we have so much to do, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, let me take one more um, question from the chat. I haven't seen stuff coming in. One of them's really long. Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna cherry pick. Catherine Quinn is here and asked the question. I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to the student pressures behind why they try to get the expected answer and how you can avoid these pitfalls in the restructured labs. Um, so why, why do we think students wanna get the expected outcome? We, we think it comes from sort of history of um, like middle school and high school lab courses where um, unfortunately the sort of content answers have been prioritized over the experimental physics practices. We are hoping that that's going to start to change as, for example, the next generation science standards start to get implemented with a bigger focus on experimental physics practices. But um, often people still are using sort of the practice in service of theory. And so I think that there's this, this interesting tension of um, seeing whether courses start to actually just do sort of practice for the sake of practice. Um, I don't know if that's going to, we'll see if that happens. We are after five, so I should cut it off. And I'm happy to keep chatting uh, if folks have additional questions. So. Thanks.